Each of us has a unique career story to tell. For some, these fly high like rocket launches. For others, they're more like the game of shoots and ladders, with advances and setbacks along the way. Either way, we learn countless lessons from these experiences. And that's what we put into the spotlight here at Career Sessions Career Lessons. Join discussions featuring a variety of guests sharing their stories of ups and downs, as well as the secrets of their success and what drives them to continue moving forward. We break down the tools and resources that will help you establish your dream career and realize your professional goals. Here's your host, J.R. Lowry. Hi, I'm J.R. Lowry. This is Career Sessions, Career Lessons, which is brought to you by Pathwise.io. Pathwise is dedicated to helping you be the best professional you can be, providing a mix of career and leadership coaching, courses, content, and community. Basic membership is free, so visit Pathwise and join today. Today, my guest is Michael Watkins. Michael is the Professor of Leadership and Organizational Change at IMDb in Switzerland and the founder of Genesis Advisors, an executive coaching firm focusing on accelerating transitions into new roles. He is a globally recognized transitions expert and the author of the best-selling book, The First 90 Days, Proven Strategies for Getting Up to Speed Faster and Smarter. He spent the last two decades working with leaders as they transition to new roles, build their teams, and transform their organizations. In 2023, Michael was inducted into the Thinkers 50 Management Hall of Fame. Michael has authored 15 books on leadership and negotiation and hundreds of articles for leading business journals. He has a new book, The Six Disciplines of Strategic Thinking, that we'll be discussing today. Before joining IMD in 2007, Michael was an associate professor at the Harvard Kennedy School and Harvard Business School. Originally from Canada, he studied electrical engineering at the University of Waterloo and business and law at Western University before earning a PhD in decision sciences at Harvard University. Michael, welcome. Thanks so much for doing the show with me today. Great to be here. Yeah, I appreciate it. So let's start with your current mix of work. You are at IMD Business School in Switzerland, and you also have an executive coaching practice. So tell us a little bit, first of all, about the work and what you teach at, at IMD. Sure. So I, IMD specializes mostly in executive education. So we have a small MBA program, but overwhelmingly it's you know, EMBAs, uh, executive programs, both in company and open. Uh, I teach one of IMD's big open enrollment executive programs. It's called the Transition to Business Leadership Program. I'm the co-director of that program. And then I also teach a version of the First 90 Days program, a uh, virtual program a few times a year through IMD. So I'm basically, I'm kind of 50% of my time at, uh, at IMD these days. Yeah. And then you've got a coaching practice that you do as well. Yep. So after I uh, published the first 90 days originally back in the early Paleozoic era, as I describe it, right, 2003, um, there was a lot of interest in, you know, help getting people up to speed better and faster in roles. I was doing programs. I was doing coaching. And so we we launched a, a company basically around the first 90 days. Today, we do a bit more than that. We do also team acceleration. We do some work transformation work. But the first 90 days and transition acceleration is still really a core part of what we do. And who are your typical clients? Just a range of corporations and. Yeah. So it's mostly, you know, mostly global sort of fortune 500 ish type companies. Um, we're U S based, but we're servicing globally. We've got a network of coaches. And so basically it's mostly like that. Exactly. JR. It's, it's a, an ongoing flow of people going into new roles. I mean, one of the beautiful things about, transitions is there's always people going through them right so there's a, right it's, it's kind right. of a, it's an ever, it's an evergreen kind of business yeah and obviously you do a lot of writing uh, you have a new book out i think it's your 15th called the six disciplines of strategic thinking leading your yep. organization into the future so let's start with that what was the spark of this particular book and what's its overall message well, just before that, so, so you say 15 books and that sounds very grand right but um you know i basically joked that i had one book that you know, sold like now I think it's close to a couple million copies and, you know, 14 books that sold like 50 copies each. Right. So you got to keep these things <laughs> in, in perspective. I'm hoping for a, a better, a better hit with this one. I mean, it wasn't quite that bad, but you know what I mean? Right. Um, it's always a bit of a challenge coming off writing something super successful. And one of the challenges I faced was right at the start, do I want to take on something 
yeah. do or should I just keep on plowing the same, you know, furrow I've been plowing for, for many years. You know, it, the impetus was really working with my own clients personally, right? So I mostly coach senior execs uh, taking new roles. My favorite group to work with are first time CEOs, right? So you're, you know, you're stepping up into the CEO role for the first time. That's a really big leap. You know? Yes. And one of the things you need to do is craft and execute the strategy for your organization. And what I noticed was there were some people that were just astoundingly good at it, right? At the strategic thinking piece of it. And others that were, you know, they were, you know, they were smart people, but there was something about the way they thought that wasn't quite as good as the folks that were just outstanding at it. And so that kind of got me interested in the subject. And then when I dug in, you know, there, there's so much that's been written about strategy, as I know you know well, right? I don't think necessarily the world needs another book on strategy at this point, although I'm sure there's new things that are being developed. A lot less on strategic thinking, right? Lots on the strategy part, but not so much on the thinking part. Mm -hmm. And what is the set of mental capabilities that let, you know, senior leaders effectively recognize, prioritize, mobilize to deal with emerging challenges and opportunities? And that was the basic starting point for me is, you know, if you're going to be a senior leader in an organization these days, given the, the incredible turbulence that we're witnessing on so many levels, right? You've got to be leading your organization and doing those three things, right? Recognizing emerging challenges and opportunities early, prioritizing the right things, right? To focus on. And then mobilizing your organization to really start to respond, right? So it's kind of a sense and respond kind of dynamic. And that was the way I kind of anchored my thinking about this, right? Around the, that recognize, prioritize, mobilize cycle. You know, you've, you've got some military experience. That it took me back to a little bit to the old OODA loop stuff, right? Of, you know, moving through response cycles quickly that we came out of the, came right. out of the military. And from there, it was okay. So what is it? What are the set of mental capabilities that let leaders recognize, prioritize, mobilize? This, by the way, we can talk about, you know, there's some things I include in strategic thinking that I think haven't traditionally been included in strategic thinking, like political savvy as a yeah. core dimension, right? That's not something you know, you'd see, I think, anywhere right. probably in discussions of strategic thinking, but it's super important, you know? Yeah. But yeah, that was the original impetus was just working with these folks and then like all these things, you've kind of got to get your head around, can you actually make a difference with people or not, <laughs> right? You know, if it's just you, you have it or you don't, you know, or you've got it so much and that's the end of the story, you know, good luck and God bless. It's still interesting to look into why, you know, what it is, but it's not all that helpful if you can't provide people with some guidance about how to get better at it. And I do believe people can get better at it. We can maybe talk about that, that later on. Yeah, well, I mean, we can come to that now and come back to some other things later. I mean, you make the you ask the question in the book, you know, are strategic thinkers born or made? You have a point of view, as I think you alluded to a second ago, that you can learn this skill, right? It isn't some people are naturally better at it, perhaps, than others, but others can learn it. So, so I have this little simple, you know, representation of the way I think about it, right? Which is your strategic thinking ability is the sum of your endowment, which is the kind of the mental machinery that you kind of came with, you know, your experience, that is your experience doing things that exercise those kinds of capabilities, the roles you played in the past, you know, the, the fact that you were encouraged to play chess as a child, I'm making this up, right? There's things, but there's things that actually exercise the capability or, or sorry, that are experiences that do that. And then there's this component I call exercise, right? Which is literally like an exercise program you can engage yourself in that can help augment your strategic thinking capability. And for each of the elements of strategic thinking, I try to provide some ideas about how to do that, right? How to kind of put together a, a sort of an exercise program to help you help you do that uh, and help you get better at it. I, you know, it's it's like all great human capability, right? Is it nature? Is it nurture? Yes. <laughs> the relative percentages we can probably debate. I used to teach negotiation a lot, and I always felt like if I could get people 10 to 15% better at negotiating, right? and you kind of have that over a lifetime, you know, I, I, want a, I want a commission of that, you know, value creation. I think it's probably something of a similar, similar order, right? We're not going to take someone who has very little inherent capability and turn them into a great strategic thinker. 
but we could take someone who's pretty good and make them better, substantially better, uh, in my view. And this is obviously important for companies. You mentioned a minute ago, you know, just the increasing complexity of the world. How is increasing complexity making it more important? I don't know how you feel about the, the world as it currently is, right? But if there's been a time where we face more large challenges and are experiencing more turbulence in history, I, I kind of struggle to identify when that was, right? Maybe Second World War, maybe earlier times where there were these great global you know, shifts, but you kind of take what's going on with climate change, right? And the pretty clearly accelerating issues we're facing there. I was reading a, an article a couple of days ago, uh, a survey of AI researchers about how soon they think AI will do everything better than humans. And it's not that far off, right? Yeah. You know, there's some people that think it's three years off there, right? Think about what that means, right? And right. So the, the, the acceleration of, of AI, you know, the, the amount of political and, you know, uh, global turbulence, right? The wars that we've, you know, we haven't seen major wars and in places like Europe or the Middle East for a long time, right? And they're, they're very serious undertakings that's going on. Supply chain issues, you know, epidemics, we could go on and on and on, but there's an enormous amount of turbulence and very large challenges that business leaders face today. And I don't think strategic thinking is the only important capability to, to help navigate through that, but it's certainly an essential one, right? I mean, I would add for leaders, organizational agility and how you create organizations that are agile in the face of, of this, right? I would probably add personal resilience as a core capability. But if you've got someone who's a strong strategic thinker, can create an agile organization and is personally pretty resilient, we're in the ballpark of what I think it takes to, to deal with what's going on today. Yeah, I mean, certainly there is a lot going on in the world, you know, geopolitically at the moment, discussions around climate change and how quickly that will hit many other things as well. I think for me, the big thing that really feels like it continues to happen is the pace just gets faster and faster. And, you know, when we were limited by you know, the pace at which you could travel distances and the pace at which you could communicate over distance, things happened more slowly. You had more time to reflect and adapt. You know, you talked earlier and you talk about this in the book, the recognize, prioritize, mobilize. I mean, that cycle has to happen a lot more quickly than it used to. And to me, that's what makes it harder. It's 100%. just that how, how quickly you have to iterate those cycles you know, I, I think about, you know, we were talking a little bit before we started recording about sort of school background. And I can remember an exercise. It was, you know, like a simulation group exercise that we went through in school where you were managing a supply chain. And yep. essentially you got badly whipsawed if you didn't manage it well by the end of the exercise, because, you know, demand is moving, competitive dynamics are moving. And if you weren't really positioning yourself to be able to adjust to that, you know, yeah. this comes to some of the systems thinking pieces that you talk exactly. about in the book. And if you, you weren't adapting to that, you were going to end up losing the game. If you were able to figure out a way to adapt to those cycles more readily, you would end up doing well in the game. And that was the whole point. And, you know, that process just, you know, it's happening so bang fast on. right now. No, you're bang on, right? And I think it it's not exactly an, ac an accident that recognize, prioritize, mobilize, the initials are RPM, right? And so yeah. moving around that cycle faster right, is in and of itself a dynamic source of competitive advantage, right? I yeah. think this is what you're saying. I 100% agree with you. Yeah, so let's get to the, the six principles, um, pattern recognition, system analysis, mental agility, structured problem solving, visioning, and political savvy. We, we probably don't have time to go through all of that, yeah. but but let's talk about a couple um, and a, sure. a couple that I wanted to pick out. One was mental agility because it's something which probably is a little bit vaguer as a concept. What does it really mean to possess mental agility? So again, maybe just back up really slightly, which is, you know, the first three of those I think of as the fundamentals for the recognize and prioritize part of the cycle, right? If you can recognize patterns, see, you know, you're an engineer by training, see the signal in the noise, you know, um, 
understand what's really consequential. If you can think in systems terms so that you understand action, reaction, feedback loops, you know, tipping points, that all really helps you a lot with that recognize, you know, and prioritize elements, right? Right. You, you, you're bang on, which mental agility is a little bit of an amalgam of, of things, right? Um, it's really two things that I kind of decided to, to squash together in part because they felt like they were connected and in part because I didn't feel like they kind of stood up to chapters necessarily on their own. One is what I call level shifting, right? And that's the ability to, as a CEO I've worked with many years uh, with calls, you know, cloud to ground thinking, right? The ability to look at things from different levels of analysis, right? See the big picture, you know, be up at 50,000 feet, dive down into the detail, pop back up to the, the the key tactical, you know, issues. And and it's not just being able to move between those levels. It's about being able to do so with intention, right? Being intentional about what altitude you're flying at, you know, is right. kind of the way I sort of think about it. And that also, by the way, connects to, you know, an exercise you can do, which is just, you know, as you're in a meeting, kind of going from what to the balcony, as it were, what's going on in the big picture here down into the detail. And it's 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 a really essential capability because you don't want leaders who are stuck in the clouds and you don't want leaders who can't see the big picture, right? Right. You know, it's it's that it's that set of capabilities. And it is an example, I think, of one that you can you can build up your your mental muscle to do it just by self-consciously, you know, exercising your and also asking yourself back to the intentionality point, what's the altitude I need to be flying at now? Yeah. Right. And I'm sure, you know, you're really experienced business exec. I'm sure you understand what that means, right? And you're, I'm sure you Absolutely. also understand what it means not to be flying at the right altitude, right? People are going, why is he, why is he stuck in it and mired in this detail, right? Or we're talking up in the clouds here and, you know, we got to get concrete, right? And I'm sure you've seen examples of both those things. Yeah. I had not heard the phrase cloud to ground thinking before reading the book. And I actually really like that. I, Somebody I worked with long ago at McKinsey called it porpoising, you know, just sort of the analogy yeah. of, you know, doing what a porpoise would do and whatever you call it. I like cloud to ground thinking better, I think. But, it, you know, just that that ability to operate up here when you need to, to operate down here. Uh, for me, that that has always been something that I've really valued in the people that I work with, because, you know, there are times, as you say, when you need people up, you know, at 50,000 feet you know, able to really see the big picture, to understand that there are other forces at work, maybe than exactly. the ones that they're most interested in. And then there's times where you just need people to like roll up their sleeves and get into the details. And, exactly. you know, being able to do both of those things uh, is really important. You, you link in game playing uh, as well. Yeah, so, so that, that's the other part, right, um, of the whole, the whole mental agility piece. And it's the other, it's, the second half of what I put together in that category. And it's, you know, I, I was originally trained in decision theory, game theory, negotiation theory in my PhD, right? So, uh, and I was an engineer, right, originally um, before that. Um, I think engineering gives you the systems thinking, intuition, you know, yeah, decision agree. theory, game theory, very much give you the, the game thinking, right? Of action and reaction of, I make a move, what's the counter move? What's the counter move? Thinking forward a few moves, reasoning back to what you need to do today. And I think it it is again, a, a kind of mental flexibility or agility, right? That you need to be able to do that. Um, you, you know, is it exactly the same capability that drives cloud to ground? Probably not, but there is something about your ability to shift between levels thinking uh look forward and reason backward that felt connected enough to me they are to to kind of package them in a in a chapter um the, the game thinking piece super important right i you know and again there's things you can do if, if you grew up playing chess i did not grow up playing chess then it's tremendous training for that kind of thinking right right and it marries itself super well to pattern recognition right because chess grandmasters they see a chessboard in a way I don't know if you're a chess player, but I'm I'm not a an exp, you know if they see things on a board that we just don't see. They see patterns, they see possibility, they see opportunity, right? But they're also able to reason forward, you know, and think forward. Well, if I do this and this and this, right, things happen. And it's just I think it, it's again an essential capability for leaders to be able to 
anticipate competitive reaction, think about what's the best move given the likely competitive reactions we're going to make, you know, you know we're going to face. That's to me a pretty, pretty important capability. Yeah. And it comes back to the, the RPM cycle, right? In a way, just being able to anticipate, you know, how people are going to play the game, whether it's chess or go or whatever the training might be that, that right. helps you get prepared for the business world. But there is definitely some value in that. You, you talked about political savvy more in the mobilize part of your, your uh, you know, the second three in your six. Yep. I had to admit that I, that one struck me as, as a, an interesting choice uh, to put into the six because it didn't feel like it was so much a, a thinking skill, but it is an action skill and it's a really important one. Well, there's really super important strategic dimensions to it, right? I mean, before I was a leadership professor, I was a negotiation professor, right? I came off that experience doing decision theory, negotiation theory, game theory, and I taught negotiation at Harvard for many years, right? At the Kennedy School, then at the business school, before I sort of got into the first 90 days of leadership. And the school of thinking in negotiation I came out of was called strategic negotiation. And it basically embodied aspects of things like game and decision theory, right? A simple example would be, you know, what's the right order to talk to people to build momentum behind something you're trying to do? Do I talk to you first? Do I talk to your key advisor on something first? You know, it, so that there's absolutely a strategic logic to political savvy, but there's other important parts like just your emotional intelligence, right? Your ability to intuit what people really want and are looking for, right. your persuasive abilities. I mean, it's not all strategic. But, you know, if you don't have that political savvy, then you better have someone who's pretty darn good at mobilizing, right? Or people that are really good at mobilizing, or you're not going to have the impact you want, right? And so it felt like it belonged, but it's not an obvious choice. I agree with you, right? It's a little, but that's kind of fun, right? Because it leads to interesting conversations about it. Yeah, and it made sense as I read through the chapter, you use it, you know, a sort of disguised example of a of a consumer packaged goods company with a matrix structure, classic sort of classic battle that you find yourselves in, you know, yourself in if you've ever worked in a big company and you have the corporate functions want one thing and the regional people want another thing. And, you know, this particular protagonist was very much caught in the middle and having to figure out how to navigate through that politically. And, exactly. you know, you can be a fantastic thinker. I mean, it, it makes sense. I had, if you'd asked me to sort of write down skills beforehand, I probably wouldn't have listed that one, but it makes sense to include it because at the end of the day, you can be the best thinker out there, but if you can't get other people to come with you, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't. I agree, JR, 100%. And, and it also, it goes to that mobilize bucket of things you need to do, right? I mean, you know, I think people, when they think strategic thinking, mostly think the recognized prioritized elements, like am I good pattern recognition? Am I good at systems yeah. thinking? Do I have the mental agility? But, you know, those other three pieces, right? Structured problem solving, that's about leading your team through a process of making good, rigorous decisions, right? That's what that piece is all about. And a colleague at IMD and I actually have a, an article in the current issue of the HBR magazine that kind of is an extension of that about how do you spend time framing problems well before you solve them and, right. and kind of giving advice about how to do that. So that's structured problem solving. Visioning, I think, is pretty obviously part of the, you know, the strategic thinking cluster that one thinks about. But even there, it's not just about creating a vision. It's about how do you enlist people in that vision? You know, I, I use the term powerful simplification, right? How do you make it powerful and simple to pull people into that vision, right? How do you calibrate it that it's it's ambitious and inspiring, but it's got enough realism that people aren't going to go like, oh, you know, JR is off in hyperspace again, you know? Mm. So e even with something like visioning, you know, I, I think there is a necessary element of how you mobilize people around that vision that kind of is a is part of that back end of the book, basically. Yeah, and, and visioning too, I mean, that sort of ability to project forward three, four, five years, maybe even more, and think about what you want to look like then and work backward from there. I mean, I find in my own experience, there are a lot of people 100%. who really focus on sort of the now forward, right? And, you know, they're thinking one or two moves out, but they're not necessarily thinking about 
where they want to be in the long term. And the ability to do that and to work backward from that and to lay out then a path forward from there, to me, that's, you know, that's super important. really where, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 super important. It's an interesting discussion, right? Because I think that there's a whole school of thought about entrepreneurship that that really revolves around that now forward thinking that you talked yeah. about, right? It's like, what are our resources? What do we have to work with? You know, it's the, it's the Airbnb oh, the story, lean, right? Yeah, the lean startup, all of those kinds of things, right? Well, you know, the classic example is Airbnb, right? A couple of guys in San Francisco, big conference in town, no available hotels, renting out air mattresses on their living room floor, and but having a website to do it. And, you know, that they took a resource and they that they moved. Did they start off with a vision for where they were going to go? Probably not, right? Mm. But equally important to your point and where the real power comes, I think, is if you can also do that, look forward, work backward, thinking as right. well, right? And, and kind of mesh those things ideally to, together, I think. Yeah. You talk at the beginning of the book and you come back to it at the end of the book, this formula of endowment and experience and exercise to help somebody get better at doing this. You had some tips at the end of the book, particularly around how to get experience and the exercise, yeah. because it, yep. it's hard sometimes to get yourself in a situation where you're actually pushed to develop your strategic thinking. So actually, uh, another colleague and I had an uh, article in HBR, a digital article about communicating like a strategic thinker. Right, just the act of talking like you're a strategic thinker turns out to be super important, right? And so, what's the language you use? What do you focus on? How do you frame what's happening? Yeah, because I think the, the point you're making, JR, is exactly right. It's it's you know, how do you prove you've got strategic thinking capability if you're not in a role that requires strategic thinking? It's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing, right? Right. But one thing one thing you can do is is bring strategic communication and and you know articulation to everything you do early and that's a way of demonstrating that you've got that 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 sort of capability so that's a, a separate little article that kind of extends that part of the thinking a bit more and then exercise right i i actually just wrote a, a short piece about using simple online games to work on your strategic thinking capability right so i play a few online games every single day right i start with wordle if you know it right um yesterday i got it in three usually i can get it in four super you know super happy when i get it in three right i play a, a, another new york times game called connections if you know it that's about like yes. 16 words and you got to try and figure out what the relationships are that exercises a different part of your mental muscle i play a washington post game that's kind of a word game it's like a a form of crossword you know like sudoku I wrote this little article basically on here's a little daily regime you can use to kind of just keep your brain ticking over, right? I, I do, I'm, I'm not a chess player. My my kids started playing chess on chess.com and I play my youngest son usually badly, uh, I should say, but there's also a daily chess puzzle, right? And I, I do it every day, you know, I get in there and it takes five, 10 minutes and sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. But inevitably, it gets me thinking about action or reaction, move and counter move, right? So, so one thing I think you can do is just start to play games, right? And the yeah. games themselves are fun, and it doesn't take that much time, right, to yeah. do it. But it exercises certain parts of your brain. And I think, you know, there's lots of evidence, too, that doing that actually has long-term, you know, brain benefits as well, right? It helps right. keep dementia at bay and other, other things like that. There's other exercises, you know, I, I, there's one I... In the visioning chapter, I talk a little bit of a, an exercise that a colleague of mine introduced to me many years ago called the architect's exercise. And the basic idea is anytime you enter a new space that you haven't been in before, you step back and you look at the space and you think, you know, how, how could I make the functionality of this space better, right? What could I do that, that what changes would I make in, in the space, the, the furnishings, the everything that would make it a more attractive space, a more usable space. And so, so much of this to me is just, it is like, like exercise, right? It's like having that yeah. daily workout, right? It's, you keep your brain ticking over in some way so that when you need to use those capabilities, they're already kind of warmed up Yeah, uh, to a degree. Yeah, good advice. I wanna switch gears and talk about the first 90 days 
uh, sure. you know, as you said, at a few points during the conversation, it's it's the book for which you're you're best known. Did you have any idea when you wrote it that it would become such a seminal? Nope. I, I describe myself as the accidental guru, right? Because I didn't I didn't ever kind of imagine that this would happen. And it, it happened at a funny time too, because I was up for tenure at HBS and didn't get tenure, but almost simultaneously the first 90 days was published and went on the on the business week bestseller list which was then something that people paid attention to for like 18 weeks or something crazy right so i i was both kind of like oh you know i disappointed i didn't get tenure gosh what am i going to do with myself and oh you know like wow this thing's taking off like a rocket you know right and that's when i founded the, the leadership development the executive coaching company uh, originally um, but no, 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 I, I think I just happened to catch a wave, you know, there, and timing, as you know, I'm sure very well is everything. There wasn't a much out there about how to take charge in a new leadership role, right? There was plenty about leadership, there was plenty about change, but, but that real incredible challenge of taking a new role, getting yourself up the, the learning curve while simultaneously having an impact in the organization. Yeah, there wasn't much there. And, and also, I think what help, helped a lot was I'd published a previous book on a similar topic uh, a few years earlier, and Johnson & Johnson had come to me to develop programs for their execs around that content. This is pre-first 90 days. So I spent a couple of years going around the world teaching programs to folks, you know, director VP level folks taking new roles. I refined a lot of the ideas, right? just by virtue of interacting, you know, regularly with groups of people taking new roles, right? The STARS model, right? Startup turnaround, accelerated growth, realignment, sustaining success. The idea that the way you transition depends on what you're up against came out of that, those programs. And so the first 90 days was kind of almost a distillation of all of what I'd learned from doing that. And I think that made it super practical. You know, yeah. it made it, it made it something people could grab and actually say, okay, this is going to help me make sense of this, right? Organize myself to, to, to be successful, you know, in, in these, in these transitions. Yeah. You know, I think having read a lot of business books over the years, you know, some are dry, some are very story oriented, you know, the ones I think that tend to probably do the best are the ones that are, are some mix of, you know, they, they make one sort of really intriguing point and they weave a story and examples around it, or they just are really practical. And the, to me, the first 90 days, 10 pieces, there's frameworks for each, there's practical guidance for each. I mean, often, you know, when you're coming into a new job or a new organization, particularly if you're a senior leader, all the eyes are on you. you you've got to accomplish a lot every day. Having a playbook and a framework for a playbook, which is exactly what that provides, it hits the mark and you know for me it certainly it hits the mark in terms of what a lot of transitioning leaders need because it it just gives you useful guidance that you can sort of distill and digest and incorporate right away well thank you you know i again i have my little jokes about this right and i say you know there are too many business books that should be articles yeah and there are too many articles that should be paragraphs right and so i think one characteristic of my writing is there tends to be a fair amount of substance to each chapter that I write, you know, like if I'm going to write a, a chapter on accelerating your learning when taking a new role, that's going to be a fairly deep but useful. And then there's a chapter on how do you match your strategy and situation. And then there's a chapter on building alliances, right? And I think it's something about the way I write and think. Maybe it's the engineering training, partially, yeah. um, probably not even partially, probably substantially. I think this book that the book we were just talking about, the six disciplines, is similar, right? Each each of those chapters to a degree stands on its own. They're connected, but they stand on their own as a kind of a a, a reasonably deep but practical dive into something important. You know? The other thing I've I've always tried to write about things that I think have eternal leadership significance. You know, leadership transitions have been going on from the beginning of human experience right right people have negotiated from the beginning of time people have had to think strategically forever right and i think it's particularly important given how fast things are are happening to try and find those things that remain kind of eternal leadership capabilities 
and focus attention on. on another I'm interested in these days is is leadership presence right what does that mean exactly is something I'm thinking about these days it's been 20 years I think since you <clears throat> first wrote the book have your own thoughts on successful transitions evolved a lot over time absolutely right so first edition was 2003 second edition was <clears throat> 2013 sorry <clears throat> um the book was probably 40 percent new content for the second edition because a lot had changed in, in the, that intervening 10 years in the last 10 years i'm writing the third edition now so i'm thinking a lot about this mm. so much has changed right R remote work right no one had any notion of what it meant for remote work the pace your point earlier right the, the pace at which things are happening right i sometimes joke it's not the first 90 days anymore it's the first 90 minutes you know yeah i mean it's still it's still a relevant um you know the way we think about teams has changed right the whole rise of the importance of psychological safety in teams has changed i've also you know in the intervening 10 years i've written dozens of articles about dimensions of this right for example in the original book in the second edition there was a chapter about securing early wins that was mostly about how do you pick the right things to focus on to kind of drive your momentum but there's a whole piece there about how do you arrive well in a new role you know uh, leverage your brand your leadership brand have the right presence coming in build credibility early that's going into the new version of the book because I hadn't really thought deeply enough about that piece but it's super yeah. important yeah using the 90-day cycles on an ongoing basis is another thing that's going to go into the new edition of the book yeah like literally how do you kind of manage your business in 90-day sprints like what does that look like and mean uh some new ideas about how you establish direction right I I'm very interested these days in leadership as mobilizing and focusing and sustaining energy in organizations so that's a, a that energetic idea is something that's going to be very much infused in the new edition that wasn't in previous editions right so it's 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 stuff like that right the, the big challenge i face by the way is not overpacking it with a bunch of stuff you know? yeah you know when you've written you know dozens of articles about different pieces of this you, you, the tendency is to kind of say okay let's you know, let's let's take all those pieces and I guess if I have one big worry about it, it's that I make it too complicated, you know? Yeah. Um, there's, there's a balance. Yeah. There's clearly an important balance. No, there's absolutely a balance. I'm guilty of that sometimes of trying to pack too much in, you know, to an argument and you have to kind of keep it distilled down. It comes back to, you know, some of the things you talk about in your current book about if the message is so complicated that people don't really understand it. This is an, I think, in your visioning chapter, yep, exactly. you know, if, if you can't bring bring people along with you in that vision in a way that's sort of clear and compelling and you know simplistic enough then you know you'll lose them and I think coming back to this is what makes a good business book if the, if the book's too complicated you know it just it you you lose people in it it's interesting you know this idea of business presence I think about it's been about two and a half years since I, I joined the company that I'm with now uh, and I thought a lot about you know how did I want to come in? How did I want to represent myself? How did that build on the way that I had worked in the past? What did I want to do similarly? What did I want to do differently? Uh, that was definitely a consideration for me because I think it's, you know, it is, yeah. and that's definitely different than 20 years ago, right? To your point about how, you know, the the way you manage and lead teams is different. You know, the concept of psychological safety, it, it's the, the command and control era of leadership to me is rapidly dying off probably still out there in you know some industries but it's largely gone and so it's it's a much more complicated leadership environment than it used to be so you have to think a lot about you right um not just the task and the culture and, and your and, boss and all and, of how, and how you show up and how you yeah. show up every day yeah yeah and no 100 100 percent agree right and, and also you know Gen Z and beyond the importance to those younger people of a sense of purpose and inspiration and in what they do right and you've got to adapt to that as a leader today you know yeah if you're, you know I I worry a little bit about those generations given the challenges we're likely to face but it's uh today it is absolutely important for many many leaders that they have and are able to communicate a sense of purpose in what they're doing right 
because that's a core part of what's engaging it, those those younger workers today. Very, so. very much so. You know, you do a lot of coaching of people on transitions. Are there yep. pitfalls that you see them, traps that they often fall into that you would want to share in terms of what to avoid? Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and interestingly, those haven't changed those much, that much over time, right? It's still, you know, Marshall Goldsmith wrote a book. I'm sure you know what got you here won't get you there, right? Right. Um, it that's the the biggest one, right? Thinking that you're going to be successful doing what you've done in the past, only more of it or better, right? You know, and not recognizing you come to those moments when what got you here literally is not going to get you there. You need to step up with a different set of capabilities. You need to let go of some things that you're maybe really good at and love doing, right? So, and embrace things that maybe you don't feel quite so comfortable. So it's it's a variation on the comfort zone trap, but it's the number one thing I see. The other one, I, I, I call it the action imperative, right? The sense that you have to take action, you have to do something, you have to prove to them, whoever they are, that they made the right choice in putting you in the role. You know, and of course, there's there, you have to be realistic. You you do need to move quickly, often, right? And there are things that you you can't put off happening, and it's dangerous to to do so. But too often, I see people starting to make early calls or try to put their stamp on things, or you know, make decisions where they're, they're not as informed as they need to be, and the pressure to do that is coming from inside them as much as anywhere. Yeah. So that notion of the action imperative, I think, is a an important one. And then there's one that I think is related to the the political savvy chapter in the matrix organizations you describe, which is not building lateral relationships early enough, right? Like not reaching out to your peers, not reaching out to those key stakeholders, you know, um, not investing early in building that network, right? And focusing too much in the vertical. Those would be some examples, JR. Some of those things you mentioned, I mean, I know you wrote the book with more of a C level senior leader in mind, but, you know, for anybody joining a new company, right. Or taking on a new job, you know, a lot of Absolutely. what's here applies. The stakes might not be quite as high because you're not perhaps in as big a role or senior role, but a lot of the same principles apply. And one of them certainly is, you know, coming in and just being too narrowly focused on, you know, this is my team, this is my boss, you know, managing vertically without, thinking about the horizontal and the relationships that you build across the organization. You know, if, if you fail to do that, I think when you come into a new organization, you're going to hinder yourself in the longer term. Absolutely. And, and then for people coming in from outside organizations, right? Culture is a huge issue, right? And understanding that organizations really do have cultures and they are different. You yeah. know, I mean, you alluded, you alluded when we were talking earlier about the difference between military culture and business culture, right? That's an enormous difference. And people coming from the military into business can really struggle. So too can people coming out of, you know, a, a more command and controlish type organization into a much more, you know, lateral, agile organization, right? Um, where I see people really struggle there is the first time they make a major shift from one organization to the other with a very different culture, because they think, you know, that this is just the way it is, right? This is the way organizations work. And then they discover, well, wait a minute, you know, no, you know, um, the example, I, I don't use the example anymore as much, but I, I've done a lot of work historically with Johnson & Johnson, great organization, very relationship focused organization, mm -hmm. especially at the top. And, you know, you'd see someone coming in from, let's say GE in the old days, right? And they come in up from this very process focused, much more command and control organization. And they kind of hit this, this like a, you know, like a brick, right? Because it just, you know, they, they, they'd start saying things in meetings and, you know, making, you know, what they thought were good points. And people are kind of like, you know, like, um, and often didn't last as a result, right? I mean, I, again, little jokes. I used to say that you should always hire people from GE on their second job after GE, right? Because someone else has sanded the corners off them a little bit yeah you know yeah it's it but so culture is, is critical i think when you're onboarding when you're being promoted it's a different set of challenges right i mean and, and the biggest ones often happen when you're promoted in place and you're leading former peers that's a big one right leading people that were formerly your peers that's a very big challenge often right because you've got to completely change the nature of the relationships you may have people who 
thought they should have the job. Right. You may have people who think you're there, think or, you know, honestly are good friends, but the relationship has to change. Part of what's fascinating for me, you know, is just how many different types of transitions they are and how each one has its own logic to it. You know? Yeah. I mean, there's a, a book, uh, the, the, the Making of a Manager, I think it's called mm -hmm. um, by Julie Zhu. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she talks about the different ways that you can become a manager and how it matters. And, you know, again, I think she's thinking about first line managers, but, you yeah. know, whether it's first line, second line, you know, C-level, whatever the case may be, you know, the different ways in which you can move into those roles absolutely drives the transition. You know, if you're Usually. all of a sudden leading your peers, if you're in the same organization, or if you're in a new organization and, you know, in some ways comes back a bit to this, this piece you want to include in your new edition around, you know, the, the business presence and the leadership presence, you know, you have more degrees of freedom in a way when you move into a new organization than you do in an existing one. And absolutely. that matters. It, it absolutely does. Right. I mean, another example I use sometimes is, you know, when your boss is promoted and you're promoted and you're still reporting to the same person, right. But you're now leading the organization they used to lead. Yeah. Right. And, and there are some things you feel like really aren't working and you need to change, but you're telling the person who led the organization before yeah. you do that their, their baby isn't beautiful. Right. Right. I mean, it's, it's just, right. it's, it's endlessly fascinating, JR. I mean, I, I, even after many years I've spent doing this transition is still fascinating because yeah. there's so much nuance to it. Yeah. It's fun, right? It's you know, coming back to this idea of, you know, playing games and learning and all of that, it, it, you know, you, you sort of Absolutely. balance, you know, the sort of the day to day with, you know, what you're sort of learning yourself. 100%. Absolutely. What, what are the things I know you do a lot of writing and thinking about topics? What are the ones that are particularly top of mind for you right now outside of, you know, the content of your latest book and this new edition of the first 90 days? So I mentioned one already, which is leadership presence. I'm pretty interested in that these days. And how do yeah. we think? How do we think about what that really is, right? And how it really develops. So that one I'm thinking about, you know, unsurprisingly, like everybody else on the planet, AI is pretty interesting to me these days. And so yeah. I actually just wrote an article about different levels of human capability that are going to be taken over by AI over time. Right. And trying to think about how that's likely to evolve and how businesses can kind of plan to, against that very dynamic evolution. Right. I mean, what I worry about there, and again, I, this is going to make complete sense to you, I think, right, is I see lots of organizations dealing with AI as if it's static. Right. OK, we've got ChatGPT. How do we how do we, you know, or ChatGPT4, how do we adapt to ChatGPT4? Important question. But equally important is what's ChatGBT five going to look like, and six, and seven, and ten. Right. How quickly are they going to happen? What capabilities are they going to have? What's that mean for how we need to think strategically about our organization, our workforce? Right. And so there's a real danger in getting caught in a reactive planning mode as opposed to something that's more proactive and anticipatory. And so I just I've just been working on a piece about that with a, actually with the CEO that I, I do a fair amount of work on. Yeah, I mean, AI, certainly in my industry, in any industry, I mean, you can't help but think about it. And, you know, you you have to contemplate how you use it. How do you control it? How do you deal with the, the human consequences of it, right? I mean, I, I'm not sure Absolutely. where I fall on this, you know, uh, this idea of is it going to take over the world or, you know, is it going to massively make life better for the humans in the world? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think we're going to have to steer it in a way that yeah. works for humanity. Otherwise, you know, it's it's a, not a force for good. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have to say I'm, I'm a little bit on the pessimistic side of, of mm -hmm. this. JR. I mean, I think, you know, I do lots of work with pretty high level scientific folks and absolutely there's going to be incredible discovery that's going to flow from this. We've already seen some of it, incredible discovery in medicine and many, many fields, right? So that's the good news. The bad news is potentially pretty bad. And I, I don't I don't get caught up in the is this thing gonna kill us kind of modality, right? You know, I guess it's possible, you know, but it doesn't feel like that's highly likely at this point. 
what I more focus on is what's the impact on employment, society, yeah. political stability, you know? I, I'm going to read you something. Uh, there's a study that was released just a couple of days ago, big um, survey of AI researchers about their forecasted views of what's going to happen. Uh, 3,000 researchers, right? Forecast given a 50% chance of AI systems achieving milestones by 2028, and it lists what those are. If science continues undisrupted, the, the chance of unaided machines outperforming humans in every possible task was estimated to be 10% by 2027 and wow. 50% by 2047. Wow. You know, that's mind-blowing, JR, right? I mean, you know, that's yeah. every, hum every human capability, every human capability. As yeah. early as three years from now, and maybe as late as 20 years from now. I hope it's 20 years, because if it's three, you know, because so much of this is going to be driven off, how much time do we have to adapt, right? The yeah. biggest variable that's going to determine the level of disruption is how, how long is it going to take, you know, for how much time will we have to adapt, right? I mean, yeah. this is, you know, people call this a general purpose technology like electricity, right? Or, you know, like steam. I mean, those technologies took decades to have their impact fully felt in the end, right? And so there was a time for adaptation. People could move to new occupations. You could reskill people. If we're talking three years until yeah. every human capability, that's revolution, I think, right? Yeah, I mean, I would tend to believe that uh, the capabilities are going to move much more quickly perhaps than the broad implementation of those capabilities. But this is gonna be a constant threat that plays out. It's a bit like automation, you know, played out in the factory world, you know, starting what, 40, 50 years ago, you know, and the way that offshoring right. has played out in the business world. And this is just another one of those big trends that's, that will play out perhaps over a few decades, but will be a constant headwind, you know, for, you know, people who aren't really prepared for it. And that's the thing Absolutely. I probably worry the most about is that just, you know, is this just yet another thing that puts pressure on the part of society that isn't able to adapt as well? And how does that end up, you know, driving political Absolutely. changes and everything else? So. No, hundred percent. Right. And I, 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 so I know we're, we're almost out of time, but I, the other thing is, you know, the, the, the there's a problem I call the, the, you know, the nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide problem. That's an old song title, right? Um, right. You know, I mean, so when human power wasn't, was overtaken by me mechanized power, people moved to factories and the dexterity, and they assembled things and did things that machines couldn't. And then automation came along and did this and people moved into service, op you know, occupations or intellectual occupations. There was a movement to new places where people could still do useful things. I don't see any place to go. I don't see any place for all those people that are going to be displaced by AI. I don't see anything for them to do, right? Yeah. I mean, you saw what I just read to you, all human capability, right. able to be done better by unaided AI. Wow. You know, that's yeah. huge. Yeah. Well, we will see. So uh, probably a stark note on which to leave and otherwise. I'm sorry. Hopefully optimistic. Well, but, yeah, but, no, 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 but, but, but human ingenuity and, and adaptability, you don't want to bet against it, right? You don't sure. want to bet against it. I mean, it could mean a lot of disruption and a lot of difficulty, but I'm in the long run, I'm pretty confident the species will survive and, and get through it all. But yeah. there may be some bumpy road ahead. Yeah. Yeah, well, we covered a lot of ground. We didn't cover anywhere close to my long list of questions, but perhaps a conversation for another day. Um, thank you. Absolutely. appreciate you doing this. Oh, I enjoyed and, it a lot, Jared. Thank you. Yeah, and I hope uh, I hope this new book becomes, uh, you know, the next first 90 days. So if, if it does, you know, 25% as well, I'll, I'll be happy. Let's put it that way. You know, yeah. In my dreams, it does super well, but we'll see. But thanks so much, Jared. Yeah, absolutely. Have a good day, Michael. You too. Take care. I'd like to thank Michael for joining me today to discuss his work, uh, his new book, The Six Disciplines of Strategic Thinking, and his most well-known book, The First 90 Days, as well as thoughts on leadership and a little bit on artificial intelligence, some of the other trends that are affecting the business world at the moment. If you'd like to make the most of your career, visit pathwise.io and become a member. Basic membership is free. You can also sign up on the website for the Pathwise newsletter and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok.
Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to Career Sessions, Career Lessons. We hope the nuggets of wisdom shared today help guide your path to the successful career of your dreams. This podcast series is part of Pathwise.io, which is here to help you live the career you want. We provide a comprehensive mix of career and professional development events, insights, tools, and exercises backed by a group of leading coaches and other career management experts. If you aspire to something more or just something different in your career, join us at Pathwise.io. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. See you again on the next episode.